Ah, oh, okay, got it. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Tom, and, and also to you, Jeffrey. It, it's an honor to be here at this, I think, um, really uh, incredible and unique reading series that is here that you all have, and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I would just correct the introduction in one small way, which is I actually did stop at Smitty's for a little of that bre yeah. unadvisable breakfast brisket, which I just couldn't pass up. It's sort of rumbling around in there right now. Um, I am going to uh, primarily read from the book of mine that's coming out. This is a sneak preview of the book. The book will be out April 19th is the publication date. So um, this is like a, you know, it's like a trailer for it. Kind of. um, I'll do the whole thing in a trailer voice, in a time <laughs> when. Um, uh, but, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the process of the, the some of what I, th I think um, the book, uh, some of the questions the book brings up. Um, but I'm also very happy to take questions about the magazine um, after that is over if we have time. Uh, but I'm going to start by just talking about the book. Um, as they said, the book is called Nothing Happened, and then it did. And it's a chronicle uh, in both fact and fiction. It's got eight chapters. Four of the chapters are non-fictional, and four of the chapters are fictional. And it sort of alternates back and forth. Um, it's my attempt to fool people into thinking that I did things that I didn't actually do. Um, the narrator of the book stays the same throughout. And so this creates, I, I, I hope, some interesting questions for the reader about um, you know, how much to believe the person that is talking to them, the narrator. Um, I'm going to read, though, from one of the chapters that you can, be, you can actually trust and you can believe. It's one of the non-fictional chapters. Um, but it's one of the non-fictional chapters that I think has a quality that is a little bit, there, there are some qualities about it that are a little hard to believe. Um, <laughs> Which, uh, which sort of works in the context of this project. This is a chapter that um, uh, describes my um, entry in and attendance at an amateur poetry festival in Reno in a, at a, the uh, John Asquaga's Nugget Casino in Reno, Nevada. And um, a few years ago, I entered a contest that I saw an adver <laughs> advertisement for in a newspaper uh, that would enable me to potentially win $25,000 at an amateur poetry contest, so I entered in one of the <coughs> home of mine in this contest and um, attended this, uh, this convention. It um, cost me about 600 bucks to go, but that seemed like a, you know, a worthwhile investment on the, ch on the chance of winning 25 grand. Needless to say, I did not win the 25 grand. Um, I'm going to just read a little bit from the very beginning of this piece when I arrive at the convention, and then I'm going to read from the very dramatic uh, awards presentation the end of the three-day convention. And I should just say one last thing. The name of the outfit that put on this, um, this convention was the Famous Poet Society, which sounds pretty great. And you, know, you think, you know, John Keats, William Wordsworth. But actually, what the, famous, the way that the Famous Poet Society defines <coughs> famous poet is that if you're famous, like for being a B or even a C or even a D movie actor, and you have written at least one poem, you are a famous poet, and so that, <laughs> those were the um, those were the kind of instructors that we had during our, during our three days at the Nugget Casino. The guys who'd been an, an orderly in the Slumber Party Massacre in 1983, who also had written some poems, and so it was a very um, it was it was a very kind of a circus atmosphere. A lot of a lot of interesting stuff happening, um, and uh, this is this will just take you through the introduction, the <coughs> arrival, and then the awards. First time here, a man asked me. He was wearing a jeans jacket and jeans. He had a bristly brown beard and a long hawk-like nose. His name tag identified him as Doc Smith. Yes, I told him. Yours? Nah, he said, I've been here before. So you like it? Yeah, it's all right. He scanned the crowd with a sour expression. Only thing that gets annoying is all these 13-year-old girls writing about broken hearts, lost love, suicide, that sort of thing. Try going to war. Doc's voice was gruff, and his bearing suggested a long-standing annoyance with the world. He was a Vietnam veteran. I wondered if he'd ever shared the battlefield with Professor Williford, a character from a previous chapter. Before the war, he had been a singer in a band called People, whose song, I Love You, had traveled up the charts to number 14 in 1968. He sang a few bars for me. It sounded like a good song for dancing close with a girl. He gave me his card, which said, Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 290. 
in big letters and in small letters, John Doc Smith, the poet. This is an okay conference, he said, but it's not as nice as the one the International Library of Poetry puts out. When they have a champagne reception, it's all the champagne you could want, plus punch and hors d'oeuvres and top flight entertainment. Classy. He looked disparagingly at the tables. This one's going downhill. It was true that the scene lacked glamour. The Rose Ballroom did not feel much like a ballroom. The walls were carpeted in institutional gray, the floor in a tacky pattern of red and blue. The stage was empty save for an off-center podium. Fluorescent tubes lit the room unkindly, and on folding tables covered in red paper, the champagne was lined up in plastic glasses. The supply was sorely insufficient. Mostly the tables were covered with empty glasses, upside down and on their sides. They don't put enough champagne. I heard an elderly Filipino man in a three-piece suit complain. Doc seemed to know his way around the convention, so I asked him if he had any tricks for winning the cash prize. Nah, he said, just do your thing. Don't get nervous. Before he could finish his counsel, the MC of the convention, Alicia Rodriguez, called us to order. Doc snorted. He'd seen it all before, and he was going to go try his luck on the slots. According to the general schedule, we were to be introduced to the poets who would be our teachers for the next three days. There was Rig Kennedy, who had a supporting role in the 1982 film The Slumber Party Massacre, Joel Weiss, who played an orderly in The Meteor Man, and Al DeAndrea, who appeared as Lieutenant Wilkins in the short-lived television drama Brooklyn South. I'm going to jump ahead to the end, uh, the, to the awards presentation. The famous Poet Society had impressed upon us all throughout the convention that we were winners. That as far back as the first night when we had put pen to paper, we had ceased to lose. But some would leave Reno with less than others. This fact was underscored by the $6,000 in door prizes that greeted our entrance to the Rose Ballroom. After this preamble, Alicia made ready to announce the names of the winning poets. Behind her, the stage was set with a winner's circle of chairs. 17 chairs for the $1,000 third prizes, and one each for the second, first, and grand prizes, worth $3,000, $5,000, and $25,000. We all stared hungrily. <coughs> we all stared hungrily at the $25,000 seat, on which lay a red fur robe with a leopard print fringe and a 12-foot train. A matching crown in red, leopard, and gold, inlaid with red and green jewels, and a golden scepter. The ballroom was tense. Muscles stiffened. Nails were chewed. I saw at least one lucky charm brought out. <laughs> Extra sarf for wild and free, Alicia cried, and the first winner, an old fellow from Ketchikan, Alaska, with a giant white beard, mounted the stage. He read his poem, which was about orca whales, and we gave him a short hand. There was no time to dwell on the relative merits of the poem, Fortuna's wheel was spinning. Sandra Young Obendorf for Celestial Butterflies. A woman seated several tables to my left let out a small scream and ran through the crowd, throwing her arms in the air and leaping. When she read the title of her poem, she imitated the flight of a butterfly with her hands. <laughs> Vanessa O. Sullivan. Sorry, Vanessa. Vanessa O. Sullivan for Born Black. A white woman in a cowboy shirt rushed the stage. This is the second time I'm here, the first time I won. So to all of you, keep trying. Her poem was about being an oddball in a conventional family. Robert Nielsen for Dance. Over to my right, a man in a dark suit popped up and pumped his fists in the air, screaming, yes, yes, yes. Some of the winners let out huge sighs of relief and gra gazed graciously to heaven. Some were catapulted into frenzies of hugging and crying and clutching of the cheeks. One girl whose winning poem was titled, My Elusive Heart, immediately began to fan herself, as if she were worried that she might overheat. She fanned herself all the way up to the stage and then stood speechlessly at the podium for a quarter of a minute. Finally, she shrieked world peace and burst into tears. The number of empty chairs on stage was thinning when Alicia grasped the edges of the podium and yelled a name so familiar, I didn't recognize it at first. My legs, however, took her meaning immediately and propelled me into a standing position. 
where I believe I then exhibited all the celebratory tropes that the others had. Blushing and grinning and waving my hands in the air, I stumbled through the crowd while a trumpeter blasted out a here comes the king sort of tune. When I got to the stage, I met Alicia, who seemed much bigger up close and more freckled. She shook my hand. She slipped me a check for $1,000 and led me to the podium, where I turned and looked out at a sea of famous poets. On Sunday, I had fallen into conversation with an old man who had accompanied his poet wife to the convention. When I asked him if he thought his wife would get nervous if she had to read in front of the crowd, he said, she will most likely have to refer to her notes because she may forget who she is. This is precisely what happened to me when I looked out at the crowd. Who was this Jake Silverstein? His voice when he began to read sounded muffled and far away. His face was a giant mask. It was a very strange sensation, and I could see how it might work on you until you just broke down and shouted, world peace. <laughs> My chair in the winner's circle afforded me an entirely new perspective on the convention. Who really gave a damn about what poetry was or what poetry wasn't? Poetry was the check in my hand. Poetry was the golden scepter only five chairs away. Alicia cried out, Gladys Ogor Edom, for I'm a king's kid, Jehovah's princess. A black woman in a long black dress got up and gave a stirring performance in which she sobbed, screamed, waved her hand, stamped her feet, lost her voice, and collapsed into her chair completely spent, clutching a $3,000 check. Calvin G. Benito for Apache. A bald Oklahoman read in a somber elegy to the great tribe's warriors with their long black hair and sat down with $5,000. The moment was upon us, $25,000. Kathy L. Kaiser for I Choose to Dance. We looked around excitedly, but no one stood. Was she in the bathroom, writing more terrific poetry in her room upstairs? The initial applause had begun to peter out when all at once a buzz swept through the crowd, fingers pointed gasps escaped, and all eyes swung to an unused corridor of the ballroom behind a series of mirrored pillars where, with a look of grim determination, Kathy L. Kaiser of Phoenix, Arizona, slowly advanced toward the stage in a motorized wheelchair. The applause erupted with renewed vigor. Poets on the opposite side of the ballroom hopped up onto their chairs to get a better look at the handicapped laureate. Some held their cameras above their heads and snapped photos. A wave of energetic disbelief passed from table to table. Short people asked their taller companions what the hell was going on. <laughs> Wheelchairs were pantomimed and heads shaken in amazement. A cowboy poet swatted his knee with his hat. Kaiser motored silently along, her chin pressed to her chest. It was not yet time for her to celebrate. There was still the matter of what to do when she got to the stage, which had no ramp. Try to imagine the most melodramatic scene that you have ever witnessed. Now add to that tableau as many soaring eagles and galloping stallions as can be mustered. Color it in pinks and purples. Bring up the French horns. Do all of this and more, and still you would have no hope of touching Kathy Kaiser's performance that day in the Rose Ballroom. As she rolled up to the foot of the stage, the trumpeter belted out his last hurrah and fell silent. Grasping tab hunt I forgot to mention, I can't believe I forgot to mention, this. Tab Hunter, the famous Tab Hunter was uh, one of the participants in all of this. Um, grasping Tab Hunter's suntanned arm, Kaiser took a deep breath and heaved herself up onto her feet. She was standing. Gritting her teeth, she began to struggle up the stairs one excruciating step at a time. She was walking. Once on the stage, she shook loose of Tab's support and stood free under her own power. The crowd lost its mind. Alicia's husband, Bob, rigged out in a jewel-encrusted doublet with a white frilly collar, placed the laureate's crown upon Kaiser's head. Tab hung the robe from her shoulders and presented her with the scepter. Her coronation complete, Kaiser began to wobble across the stage toward the podium. Alicia crept along behind her, bearing aloft the leopard train. Her poem did not disappoint. A song leaps from my day at the at the a song leaps from my heart at the beginning of each new day. Kaiser began, a song with a melody that never plays a sad song. At several points, she appeared near collapse, but clenched her fists behind the podium and pushed on. If I have the choice of sitting this one out, I will choose to dance, she chanted. If you have a choice, dance, dance, dance. 
as far as raking up the judge's coals were concerned, you had to admit this was hard to top. Kaiser gave the crowd a royal nod and fell into her throne. Alicia thanked us all for coming. See you next year, she shouted. Poets began to file out surprisingly fast. There were planes to catch. Kathy Kaiser sat in silence, a dazed look in her eyes. Her crown was tilted, sweat ran down her cheeks. Poets, poets rushed forward to congratulate the prize winners they knew, but it did not look like Kaiser had any intention of moving, perhaps for days. Well, the other prize winners, her court, I suppose, bustled around the stage taking pictures and shaking hands and even signing autographs. Kaiser, whether with exhaustion or exultation, remained seated on her throne. Hers was a quiet reign. Within 20 minutes, it was over. Out in the hallway, I ran into Doc. I asked what he thought about the winners. Dunno, he said. I left. As soon as I heard that crap about dolphins and butterflies, I left. I could see where the judging was going. We feel, another man said, furthermore, that the time limits were unfairly imposed. Uh, again, I forgot to mention that the poems all had to be uh, under a minute long. Uh, we feel, furthermore, another man said, that the time limits were unfairly imposed. There were some on the stage who should not have been there. She could walk, said a wiry little guy with a Hawaiian shirt and tattooed forearms. We all saw her walking across the stage. I've been to LA. I've seen how the panhandlers do it in their wheelchairs with their crutches. <laughs> Gentlemen, said a man with luxurious dreadlocks, we have been duped. The man with the dreadlocks proceeded to make an allegation that I had some trouble swallowing. swallowing. He claimed that Kathy Kaiser was an employee of the famous Poet Society. The idea being that by awarding her the prize money, they could fold it back into their revenue maybe a little bit coming off the top for Kathy's show. A man whose acquaintance I have made here in Reno called into the office before the convention, he explained. Today, when Mrs. Kaiser read her poem, he recognized her voice as the same one he talked to on the phone that day. We have been had. The tattooed man let out a low, long whistle. I knew something was up, he said. I could tell the fix was in from the way the judges were acting. They weren't even paying attention. Why not? Because they knew who was going to get the prize. I went down for my group, just trying to wake up the judges. When my turn came, I says to the guy behind me, I says, this is for you, buddy. And I went out and I took a nosedive, yelling at them, doing my best Pee Wee Herman routine, jumping around on the stage like a retard, you know, just to get them to open their eyes. Well, it worked. One of the guys in my group won a prize, but I got the shaft. And I got the shaft from this other society, too. I came out here with just my shirt on my back, all the way from Jersey without a penny. And now I'm going to have to ride the train cars back, which I don't mind, because a freight car is a hell of a place to write some poetry. <laughs> My plane did not leave until the following morning. I spent Thursday, Tuesday night in the casino. The nugget is actually not as big as I thought at first, a trick of mirrors. And most of my time was passed at the aquarium bar, mulling over how I would spend my prize money. The musical entertainment came in the form of a well-oiled duo known as Bobby and Ricky whose engagement is listed in Nugget literature as indefinite. Bobby was a sax player with a genial smile. Ricky, a guitarist in a leisure suit with curly gray hair. When I arrived, Bobby was tying up the last few bars of Secret Agent Man. When the song was through, he grabbed the microphone and shouted, have some more tequila. The mostly geriatric crowd responded with a lusty yell. I noticed a table of famous poets all wearing their medallions and drinking heavily. Bobby and Ricky started into unchained melody. Dancers crowded the floor. An elderly couple stood in the center, barely swaying, locked in a tender embrace. A man wearing a cowboy hat and a shirt patterned with the American flag asked one of the poets to dance. I knew her. She had bent my ear the night before, telling me all about her unhappy marriage that fell apart a few years back and the poetry that had helped her through it. Her first poem had come to her on her birthday at the exact hour of her birth. Smiling, she gazed up at the cowboy and laid her hand on his outstretched forearm. Some of us began to sing along with Bobby. The din of the slots died away. Out of the fake thatched roof descended Apollo, god of song. The waitress stood and watched, her tray full of tequila shots, limes, salt. The muse of the lyre visited Ricky, and he strummed a lovely chord. Time and loss seemed for us distant, made-up things. <coughs> At the center of the world were Bobby's lips, singing the immortal verses, 
And in these verses, we took our solace and our hearts were gladdened. This was poetry. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we have a little bit of time left. So I thought I would talk a little bit about um, this book and its combination of fact and fiction. You just heard some of the facts. Maybe some of it seemed like I made it up, but I, I swear I didn't. Um, this book uh, began as, a, as a, a sort of a string of reported essays, similar to the one that um, I just read from, about places and people most of it is in the Southwest and in Mexico. Uh, that, that chapter takes place, obviously, in Reno. Um, those pieces are all true, and they all happen in the order in which uh, they're presented in the book. Then I went back and I inserted fictional chapters in between them, sort of connecting the dots, as if these were almost like uh, stepping stones on a path that needed, uh, you know, alternate stepping stones that needed that in-between stepping stone. And I created it out of thin air. Now, the thing that stays the constant uh, as you go between these stepping stones is the voice of the narrator. And this is what really interests me, uh, is this question of voice. To me, voice is, is at once the most identifying and also the most intangible aspect of, of any work of great of, of literature. Um, but what is it made up of? It's, it's more than just diction and rhythm and references. It includes uh, assumptions that a, a narrator makes, things that might surprise a narrator, things that a narrator already knows what he likes and he dislikes, who he wants to be. It's a total sense of where he is coming from. But the whole system of how it works, of how voice works, is based entirely on the assumptions that are made by a reader. Um, so if a narrator is speaking in, in short clips or Hemingway sentences, then the reader will make certain assumptions and maybe this guy's a tough guy or something like that. If the narrator is going to speak in long sentences, the reader will make other assumptions. If a narrator knows his way around a cheap motel or uh, you know, under the hood of a car, the narrator will believe certain things about him. And if he is comfortable in a five-star restaurant, the reader may get a different idea. And so voice creates all these interesting borderlines, I think, in nonfiction. The whole region in which voice is created is a region that's actually sort of between fact and fiction. Uh, if based on a nonfiction narrator's voice, choice of words, use of a thesaurus, <laughs> A reader makes an assumption about that narrator that is untrue. Has that nonfiction narrator told a lie? When we read, we inevitably develop a relationship with our narrators. We may be bored with her. We may wonder why she chose a particular word. We might think she's a fool. We might be awed by her genius. But we have an idea about her, and we interact with that idea accordingly. The parameters are different for fictional narrators and for nonfictional narrators. But they always operate in the same way in that we develop an idea about this person who's, who's speaking to us in our inner ear. More and more, though, it's, it's becoming hard to know what kind of narrator we're dealing with. Our recent literary history uh, has featured this fantastic outbreak of embellished or fraud, uh, uh, fake or embellished memoirs and fraudulent novels including a short, very short list. I mean, it would, go, it would sort of fill the rest of our half hour if I were to list all of them. But a short list would be The Education of Little Tree, Famous All Over Town, Forbidden Love, Misha, A Memoir of the Holocaust Years, Fragments, Memories of a Wartime Childhood, The Blood Runs Like a River Through My Dreams, and Love and Consequences, the last of which was actually recalled by its publisher like a faulty Prius. The, the most infamous, of course, of all these recent scandals uh, were the two that both hit in 2006 regard, regarding the autobiographer um, or the memoirist James Fry, whose book A Million Little Pieces got all the press. He ended up on Oprah doing his mea culpa. And then the, auto, the supposed autobiographical fictionist J.T. Leroy, slightly less well-known but also caused quite a splash in 2006. Um, and, and both of those scandals, I think, uh, point to nothing so much as the reading public's increasing desire to know what really happened in any book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Modern readers who are raised on pop psychology and reality television now make the assumption that, a, a liter that literary fiction, though it is interpreted by the imagination, has its source always in the facts of the author's life. People say, well, you know, writers write what they know, so whatever I'm reading must be what the author knew. It, it must be you know, uh, thinly veiled 
document that um, tells the truth about his life. This has given us a new genre, something kind of like the presumed memoir. And this is, in some ways, nothing new. Of course, autobiographical fiction has been around forever. Ask any fan of, of, of Mark Twain or uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Henry Miller, Jack Kerouac, Philip Roth, Sylvia Plath, Saul Bellow, the list goes on and on. In fact, it includes pretty much everybody in American literature. But rarely has the focus been so, so, uh, so <coughs> firmly placed on the autobi autobiographical element of books. In Leroy's case, J.T. Leroy's case, the reader believed that the author was a teenage boy so damaged by his past that he would only appear in public in an elaborate disguise. The relative success of his books, including uh, the Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, which was a collection of stories, and Sarah, a novel, depended on the reader's presumption that what he was reading was thinly veiled memoir. Well, would these same works uh, presented as fiction by an adult woman named Laura Albert, which is what the author's actual name was, have hit the same nerve? It's doubtful. The New York Times wrote about these books, an eyewitness imagination burns in Leroy's language, as vivid as a match held close to the face. And it's the key word there is eyewitness. Was the harrowing uh, account of Leroy's hideous childhood of coerced truck, truck stop prostitution the real draw here? Coerced truck stop prostitution. Could anything be more sensationally tawdry than what this author had supposedly gone through and what the reader could, um, could access by reading these, this, these fictions? The satisfaction in this fiction was that it did not obscure too much the transfixing reality from which it had sprung. And now, of course, we know that there was no transfixing reality from which it had sprung, or at least the transfixing reality was very different from the one described in the books. The transfixing reality was this very elaborate hoax that had been perpetrated on the reading public. J.T. Leroy was the fictional creation of this woman I mentioned named Laura Albert, a musician who had also shanghaied her half-sister-in-law into playing the role of the reclusive, reclusive teen in public. And it was a brilliant performance, a brilliant performance by both women, that capitalized in a crass way on the American reading public's impulse to always reduce fiction into autobiography. The case of James Fry, which I mentioned earlier, takes us in the opposite direction. Initially, he tried to peddle his, his story of, uh, you know, of sort of descent into drug addiction and petty crime as a novel. It was a story that was interesting, but he wisely thought that he could make it a little bit more interesting by fictionalizing and embellishing it and then slapping a novel on the cover and letting the reading public's um, tendency to read fiction as autobiography just infer that he was this dangerous man who all this horrible stuff had happened to. But rather than ending up doing it that way, he and his publishers ended up putting it forward as plain old memoir, a story that is certified to be 100% true. Now, since the whole motivation for this was to satisfy the reader's insatiable hunger to know the horrible truths that lie at the hearts of books, it was entirely appropriate that this caused a huge scandal in which the truth was painstakingly separated from the fiction. And when it came out that most of the really awful behavior Fry described in his book was completely made up. Now in my book, what I've sort of tried to do is just already separate the fact from the fiction. It's sort of pre, it's pre, uh, it's pre separated for you, for the reader's uh, convenience. Now 150 years ago, the transgressions of, of Fry might have gone undenounced in a recent book that was really fascinating called Memoir, a History by the critic Ben Yagoda, he made the point that 150 years ago in the 19th century, there was an even wider uh, outbreak of, of um, uh, fraudulent memoirs and unreliable autobiographies. Um, but unless they were about a subject matter that was very, very uh, charged, like slavery, there was many, many slave narratives that whose um, memoirs, whose authenticity were challenged, but unless a memoir was, was about a highly charged subject like that, the reading public just didn't seem to greatly care. Nowadays, however, we have a very different reading public. And uh, there's very little indication, at least to my eye, that these scandals of the past few years have changed that impulse on the part of readers. Um, we, we, we are capable, uh, as Americans, I think, of turning um, anything that we desire into kind of a commodity. And, and now that process seems to have attached itself to reality in our books. We've become consumers of reality now. But all of this questing after the truth and all these theories about reality, they obscure um, what I think is the greatest form of truth to be found in any book, and that is the writer's voice, what I mentioned earlier. 
because voice has really no allegiance to anything but itself. It turns out that it's the one intangible and untouchable element in any book, that which cannot be cornered by fact checkers or marketers or a reality obsessed reader. It's free of fact. It's free of fantasy. It's fair game for the reader and for the writer. And embedded in that peculiar arrangement of words that a reader chooses to represent him or herself on the page is, uh, is a truth that really transcends the boundaries of fact and fiction and delivers the thing that I go looking for in a book, and I think most readers do, and that's this, the contours of another human soul. Um, in, in the book that I've written, uh, the, the experiment really was to sort of see what it would be like to have to alternate between fact and fiction and really have the only constant that thread that runs through all of them be voice. Um, that as you, you know, you sort of have to hold on to it because there's nothing else to hold on to as you go back and forth. And you perhaps begin to think about um, its, its primacy over all these other uh, genres and boundaries. Um, that's all I wanted to say about the book and, and, and the reading. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions because I know that people will have or may have questions also about the magazine and magazine work. So I wanted to leave a little extra time for that. Um, thank you very much. And, and please uh, ask me any question you want, including questions about the um, casino. <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Okay, just give me one second to think about that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, see, I think that the interesting thing about um, voice and nonfiction is that it's where a writer actually does get to, a nonfiction writer, a factual writer, using facts gets to create something that is imagined. Um, the, the way that we as writers put our words together is a work of imagination, even if we're writing factual work. Um, I think obviously you have far less license than if you're a fictional writer, but, but again, it's that representation of self on the page is still a matter of, uh, of the imagination. So, I mean, I would say that the, the, the character that narrates the nonfiction um, is as real and unreal as the character that not narrates the fiction. Yes. All right. Let's see. Um, I could read a, a chapter that's from earlier in the book. Um, so. The book, this, uh, the book the, so the chapter that I read was from chapter three, which, is, which begins in New Orleans, uh, which is where I discovered this poetry competition and then flew to Reno, actually just four days after 9-11, which is a whole other thing in that, in that chapter, which is kind of crazy, um, to, to enter this competition. But prior to that, the book begins in West Texas in a little town of Marfa, Texas, where I moved in 1999 to take a job as a small town newspaper reporter. And, um, the first couple chapters are out there, and then the book ends out there. And in some ways, that's kind of the, that's, I think of as the setting of the book, even though it bounces around elsewhere. So maybe I'll read to you from the uh, chapter, the very beginning of chapter two, which is the first appearance of any fiction in this work. Okay, so this is about um, this is about my uh, uh, st stumbling onto tr um, the attempt to write a masterful um, work of uh, nonfiction, a magazine article about the drought in West Texas, which ultimately ended in failure, on my part. Our acquaintance, or my acquaintance with the with the, the local ranching, with several of the local ranchers, began innocently enough with an article for the February 3rd, 2000 issue of the Big Bend Sentinel entitled Drought Taking a Toll on Ranching. In the previous three years, local gauges had recorded an average of just four and a half inches of rain per year, the worst output in history. 
Cows were starving, crops perishing. Every month, another operation went bust. I was sent out with my notebook to take the measure of the pain. By this point, Halperin, who's the editor of the paper, Robert Halperin, tr truly the editor of the newspaper out there. By this point, Halperin had quit dispatching me to school board and city council meetings. I had a tendency, exacerbated no doubt by the stress, stress well, there's going to be some things here that we'll just have to skate over. Um, I had a tendency exacerbated, no doubt, by the stresses and torsions of my maddening quest for Ambrose Bierce to dwell on odd little details of a scene, the collection of snow globes on the superintendent's desk, the matching brown shoes worn by three out of eight county commissioners, and overlook the actual news. The week that the city council had voted to limit the number of horses residents could keep within city limits. I had devoted most of my article to the belt buckles of the citizens who had signed up to speak against the motion. This led Halpern to decide that I would be better suited to feature writing. He assigned me profiles of a local paraplegic who painted with his toes, a cook who'd been churning out chicken fried steaks in Chile Verde at Mondo's for 30 years, and a beekeeper. For the drought story, I spent two weeks roaming the dust lands around Marfa, peering into ranches that looked like giant sandboxes drinking burnt coffee with the man at the ag office, reminiscing about old dry spells with cow hands at Carmen's, and kicking the dirt with young, anxious cattlemen leveraged up to their eyeballs. It's just one paragraph. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I have, you mentioned that I've, I've talked about in the past, in the recent past, that the magazine, I think, needs to do a much better job of reflecting the demographic, um, the diversity of the state of Texas. Um, Texas Monthly has always been a staff-written magazine, which makes it rare, and uh, increasingly even more rare, among American magazines, which by and large have gone to a, a freelance model. One of the things about a staff-written magazine, though, is that People come and they get jobs there and they don't move on. And you can't blame them because there really aren't that many jobs in, in, the, in the magazine business. Well, that can often lead, I think has led over the years, to a, um, to a, uh, a kind of unity of voices at the magazine as there hasn't been turnover and there hasn't been the ability to create a more diverse chorus. Um, that's something I'm trying to do right now. Uh, it's also my one of the ways that we can address that challenge is by um, opening the doors to more freelance work and to a wider array of voices. Um, I, you know, I think it's tr you're right that the that the advertisements have tended to be um, uh, pitched toward people of a well. I, actually, I think the advertisements, if you really go through. The high, highest end advertisements obviously are pitched toward the highest end, um, highest end folks. But actually, one of the interesting things of the past year, which has been a very hard year in the publishing industry in general, and in just a, a year in which our budgets have been constrained and we've been operating with our hands behind our back a little bit, um, one of the things that has been interesting about that is that it's revealed how how diverse our advertisers are in terms of. Um, where they're coming from and the types of ads that they're that they're that they're buying and and how many there are. I mean, what's unique about Texas Monthly in American magazines is that it has local ads and national ads. Um, so what happened in the past couple of years is that all the national advertisers just you know went got screwed and you know we, we had no no more car ads. And you may have noticed that there were no more big truck ads. My my son is two and for a while he would the magazine would come home and there would always be a Chevy truck on the back and he would say. Yay, it's Papa's Magazine, there's a truck on it. And then all of a sudden there stopped being trucks on Papa's Magazine. That was a very bad sign. <laughs> um, 
Um, but what we know, what we found is that it was the small advertisers, the folks that you know, someone advertising pits and spits and the napkin ring holders and um, you know the, the small folks who actually carried the magazine through the worst of it, um, because because they still were able to purchase ads in the magazine and they still had a reason to and feel, felt like they were getting a return on that investment. So that's about advertisers. As far as the content of the magazine goes, that's my challenge and it's something that I'm currently, you know, we're in every issue trying to improve. And I take it very seriously, I should say. That's not just a pat answer. It's among my highest priorities. Um, I think that's the only place, actually. <laughs> um, it's not a big part of the book. But in that, in that chapter, I wanted to um, kind of tie together the poetry that the amateur poets at the convention were doing with the songs I was singing and uh, songs that we were hearing with sort of greater um, category of the kind of mythical Greek myths and, and, and the role of, of songs and singers and, Find time to write memoirs and fiction and edit this. This is all this magazine that you know. How many pages are these issues? Uh, well, editorial pages around um, eighty or so. Um, well, it's all an illusion because the book was finished. Uh, the book, the book had I had finished writing when I took over it at the magazine. So it's a, it's an illusion. But if you guys can keep it a secret, then you can <laughs> make people think that I'm some kind of Superman. No, I, 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 there's no way that I could um, have written this book while doing this this job at the same time. But uh, um, luckily, I was I had sort of finished it uh, just as the as the job really began, and then I was shopping. Yes, ma'am. Right. And I talk a lot about that in my classes with my students. Uh, and I saw that a lot when I was covering uh, the border realities in South Texas, because there would be five of us, and who we had access to, if one of us spoke Spanish, if one of us was from there, it really changed how the story was presented. Or if belt buckles at a city council <laughs> meeting were, you know, the thing that attracted the writer, it says right. a lot about the person covering the Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that you know we all like. There's a, there, there's absolutely. I agree with everything you said. I mean, I think when journalists go to cover something, they bring, they can't leave themselves at the door. So it's a person's perspective on what happened. But you know, the conventions of magazine journalism and newspaper journalism too, although it's a little different there, um, have us believe that you know what we read, our reading is an account of, some, of what really happened. And it did really happen, and yet you're still. But the, the key is that you're reading an account of it, and the difference. Which I've always been stunned by, um, you know, when I first, when I was first starting to write nonfiction, um, the experience of seeing an event, even if it was as sort of straightforward as a city council meeting, um, but honestly, like on a, on a even imagining a, um, a more dynamic event as well. Seeing that event, sort of experiencing it as a person, as a regular person in an event, and then the experience of seeing that event transformed into language as you write um, has never ceased to be kind of an amazing experience for me and one that feels um, uh, exciting because even though your job is to relay what happened, you're still making choices that are essentially artistic choices in some cases about the words you, cho you choose and the way you try to present things. And I don't, you know, I don't think that that my account of, uh, of an event is necessarily the most definitive one or the only one, but um, I still think that my account of an event is, is uh, an account of what really happened. It's just that there are many versions of what really happened, and that's what's, that's what's exciting. It's exciting if there are different voices represented in newspapers or yes. in magazines, but it's dangerous, especially now when you see, especially in foreign coverage, mm -hmm. you have the Oh, 
Oh, absolutely. So we've totally become like Monotown, and that's when I think it becomes. Absolutely. Well, that, and, and that's where, I mean, I think that the internet has actually offered a great corrective to that because it has enabled people like, you know, to people to report from instantly from their own perspective and do away entirely with the filter of having to actually get a job in a newspaper. You can have a Twitter account and you can be the, great, the best on the ground reporting during the Iranian not revolution. So, um, you know, that was, an, that was a big eye opener for a lot of people who followed, who followed that particular gentleman's um, Twitter feed. I mean, that, that, but it's, you know, obviously it's happening in blogs every day. And so there's a way in which um, the rise of digital journalists and amateur journalists and online has, I think, provided a little bit of a corrective to what you're talking about, although there's no way that they can be said to have the same kind of megaphone. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.